Hi, I'm Donna Hanover. Science and You starts now. Hi, I am Marlene Peralta. I visited a studio in Brooklyn where dancers are called action heroes. That's ahead on Science and You. Hi, I'm Lisa Beth Kovitz. This is where most theater artists want to end up, but it's not where theater begins. A look at the newest science play coming out of the Eugene O'Neill's Playwrights Conference, ahead on Science and You. I'm Donna Hanover. How do you cross-pollinate science and Broadway? These orchids have the answer, coming up on Science and You. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. Clowns in science, you might not see an obvious connection at first, but look more closely. That's ahead on Science and You. I'm Barry Mitchell in Brooklyn. What would you rather do, have a science lesson or watch a cartoon? Uh, I thought so. How about we do both with animator Odd Todd? Ahead on Science and You. I am Marlene Peralta. A strep lab for action mechanics is a studio where dancers slam into walls, walk onto the ceilings, and do many other physical experiments to challenge the laws of gravity. Elizabeth Streb is the architect of this unusual choreography. When the dancers, for instance, slam into the wall, what I'm trying to generate are forces that cannot be generated solely by the biomechanical movement of the body. There has to be extra force, and in a lot of ways in this particular show called Forces, we use equipment to generate um, extra directions and extra amperages and watts so that we can ride the wave of that, those forces in ways that the, the human eye has never seen a body do before. Fabio da Silva is one of the dancers. And what's extreme about Streb is that Every idea that she has, she actually has the, the means to make it uh, real. You know, she, called, she calls an engineer and says, hey, I'm thinking about this giant wheel where I want four people inside it. And they say, okay, so, you know, they design it and they show it to her and then, you know, and then she gets it done. And the way this woman, known as the daredevil of dance, gets it done is by challenging standard dancing techniques. I don't mean to be mean to normal dance, but I disagree formally with a lot of their choices. For instance, um, why do they stand right side up in space um, and only go across a two-dimensional flat surface when space is so much more complex than that? Uh, to me, that's tantamount to telling a lie about a critical, critical element in the movement lexicon. Um, also, why do they, um, you know, stay on the ground. Why don't they get off the ground and not care about the camouflaging gravity? Her extreme choreography is all about the art and science of movement. My fascination with falling and science and physics and math is because I believe that those um, bodies of knowledge are telling the truth about what happens in our world when things move. And since there is no absolute stillness, as a choreographer, I have a responsibility to know how math and physics and Newton and Euclid ordained what is true about our world. Estrev started her dancing career when she was 17, a career she says was influenced by very unconventional heroes for a dancer, people she calls crazy wild action specialists. Like all of the men and women that went over Niagara Falls in a barrel, um, Philippe Petit who walked across the World Trade Towers on a wire, um, Annie Epson Taylor, who actually was the first woman who lived and went over Niagara. Evil Knievel and his motorcycle. Um, and uh, all, all the circus, um, carnival acts that would take a move, like Houdini, and do things like just wiggle or ride. And I think that they express the sentiment of the working people and the humanity that uh, perceived what they were doing and got content and um, metaphor out of it. The fascination for physics and stunts has driven her to treat movement of the body not as an art, but as a science experiment. You know, I don't pre-calculate what will happen 
you know, once that floor starts to turn or once the dancers slam into that wall. We ask absurd questions like, can you occupy the same space at the same time? Or can you fall up? Or can you actually drop from 35 feet, hit the ground at 36 miles an hour and be okay? And really step by step, inch by inch, millisecond by millisecond, we find out information about movement and the human body that we just never knew before. Streb holds rigorous audition to select the dancers. Da Silva became one of those dancers, or for that matter, one of her extreme action heroes in 2003, fascinated by her unique techniques. The whole thing about this dance is it's not really dance. So that's why, you know, for people who have dance background, when they come to Strad, they like sort of freak out. Because they're like, you know, I've never done this before. And also, like I used to, you know, I, I like to say that it's a little bit of dance, a little bit of theater, a little bit of circus, a little bit of extreme sports, a Hollywood stunt. So it's a little bit of everything. And, uh, and that's actually w what I'm all about. A Streb Lab for Action Mechanics is not only a studio for extreme dancers, it is also an art space open to the public. Adults and children can stop by to watch rehearsals and see the amazing performances by these extreme action heroes. For Science and You, I am Marlene Peralta. So many people, when they encounter science, they encounter it in the classroom, they encounter it through a textbook. The unfortunate thing is that so many textbooks and so many classroom experiences are geared toward communicating the details of science, the methods of science and the results of science. But so rare do the stories of science play a role. So rare do the personalities that pursued those results. So rare is it that we even speak about the failures, the years and years of searching for a result, for an answer that don't yield anything that can make it into the textbook. And those heart-wrenching stories are part of the narrative of science. I'm Lisa Beth Kovetz. Every play on or off Broadway starts with a playwright's inspiration. We're heading up to the National Playwrights Conference at the Eugene O'Neill Theatre Center in Waterford, Connecticut to talk to a playwright inspired by science. What's it like to be up here at the O'Neill? It's wonderful. It's really a gift, I think, to be able to come up here and work so intensely on your piece for, for a week time. And also the fact that we're just all here. So it's really all that you need to focus on while you're here. What's creation about? It's about a uh, evolutionary biologist, a scientist, who gets struck by lightning and then becomes obsessed with music. But it's also the story of the other uh, ways that impacts his life, his wife and the neurologist uh, that treats him, as well as a young composer that he meets. So there's an actual change in his brain that moves, moves him towards the music, right. Now this is not the first time that you've been inspired by science. Right. I read a review of your play, Victoria Martin, Math Team Queen, and this review had more science metaphors in it than there are <laughs> digits in pi. <laughs> What was that play about? That play was about um, Victoria Martin, uh, who unwittingly finds herself on the high school math team. She had cheerleader friends who didn't quite approve of the, the math team, but by the end of the play, she had fully embraced her, I guess, nerdy identity. <laughs> Were you one of those geek girls in high school? I, I, I was a chemistry Olympiad silver medalist, which is, I guess, my nerdy version of uh, yeah, which, and which I adored the Chemistry Olympia. Well, nerdy is the new cool. That's true, that's true. <laughs> the name of the play is Creation. Mm -hmm. Is there an element of creation itself that is that overlaps in science and overlaps in art, that they're both striving towards truth? I think so, or I think the evolutionary biologist has one sense of creation, but then there's also, um, it's a lot about artistic creation too and the creative process, and I think that that drive and that, that searching is there both in the sciences as well as in the creative arts. Where do you think is the overlap in your life in science and art? Science excites me. I can use my more analytical brain to look at, well, this is a story I want to tell, but how is the best way to tell it and how will I translate that to stage? And I, I think that it's, it's, it's less disparate than people normally think. And it just feels, you know, natural and exciting, I think, to kind of go after an idea that's maybe more in the science world the same way I kind of go after what I'm 
passionate about writing about. From the Eugene O'Neill, this has been Lisa Beth Kovitz for Science and You. I'm an engineer by training. Uh, I went to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. I graduated with a degree in chemical engineering and a degree in theater arts. At the beginning of my directing career, I felt they were very separate. I didn't think that, um, I thought it was different ways of thinking, different ways of expression. I, it was weird to me that I would feel an inclination to both sides. And then in doing the work here, in really creating these plays about science and technology, I started really understanding the confluence of both worlds and how really both are creative outlets. They're just expressed in different ways. There's a eureka moment that happens in theater when you're creating a piece, when you see the thing that you want to create, that, that you see the moment that you've, that you've been molding, when you, when you see the moment when you've, you've been writing, you go, aha! That's sort of the same thing that happens in science. I'm Donna Hanover. There's a reason these orchids remind you of the proscenium arch in a Broadway theater. Scientists and artists are working these days to bring the beauty of their disciplines together. They used 5,000 orchid plants, 300 different species, in a recent show at the New York Botanical Garden to recreate elements of some iconic theaters of Broadway. An associate curator at the Garden's Institute of Systematic Botany, Fabian Michelangeli, says these flowers are the perfect dramatic choice. Orchids are very special in the way they are uh, pollinated because they, they have been in sort of an arms race with each other, trying to capture the exclusive uh, services of individual bees and wasps and other pollinators. So the way they attract those pollinators is with color and also scent, but color is definitely important. And those same things that are making it attractive to their pollinators make them very attractive to us. And some people even call them the divas of the plant world. So doing a Broadway show that brings the, that charismatic and diva aspect of the plants to New York City, you know, where we have the Broadway show, it is apropos, I think it, it matches well. The scientists here teamed up with some key theater people, including Scott Pask, who's won multiple Tony Awards for scene design, including for the Book of Mormon. Together, they recreated the elegant promenade of the New Amsterdam Theater, and it comes pretty close. They also crafted a dramatic chandelier that will remind some of the Phantom of the Opera, and they even set rows of flowers to stand in as the audience. I utilize the, the, the idea of theatrical false perspective, which is something that I utilize to kind of make something appear much deeper than it is, and we did that in the exhibition hall to kind of tighten your sort of focus as you're walking along this arbor right before you're kind of exploded into the room with the giant orchid chandeliers. And even the idea of color within the palette of the exhibition is something that was not always something we could count on because some things were more available and say, well, let's use the range of this orange or these yellows because the one thing and when you do something in the theater, like that red curtain is such an icon, but red is not really a color of the orchid world and you can get them in magentas and things like that. Do you have to be careful about some of the divas? You, they are tricky, those divas, <laughs> yeah. Does it want to drape? Does it want to like, stand up, like how, like there were a lot of characteristics that were important about the plant that influenced how the design was, was shaped. A standing ovation is definitely in order for the Botanical Gardens horticulturalists. It strikes me that this show is very much like a Broadway show in that there's a lot of backstage stuff happening to keep it all going, right? Absolutely, I mean, growing orchids is not an easy enterprise, it takes a very uh, dedicated and understanding person to do to, to grow orchids and it takes years to go from seed to a blooming orchid and to put something like this together you can imagine the amount of plants that have been grown in the greenhouse and all the effort has gone into timing them to bloom at a certain point and we have plants as I said from all, all over the world from a great variety of uh, environments and we have to create the specific conditions for each of those species did you come away thinking, I should have been a botanist? I like hanging out with a botanist, <laughs> but I love what I do. So I, I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to collaborate with people that are so incredibly gifted in their field. And the botanists and horticulturalists and plant specialists, orchid uh, like geniuses and everyone there are, are just fantastic. 
It turns out orchids are perfect for showbiz. The glamour of Broadway and the mysteries of science, who knew it would have such a romantic ending? I'm Donna Hanover for Science and You. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. When you see children laughing at clowns, science lessons probably aren't the first thing that come to mind. But the art of clowning around has more to do with scientific theory than you might realize. Take a look. A lot of people don't realize that every circus act you see in the circus has a scientific concept behind it. Absolutely true. Science is all around us. If you don't think of science as silly, these guys may make you think again. Meet Dr. Adam Smasher and his colleague, Professor Momentum. They are clowns with Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey. And these two professional funny men take science seriously. It's their livelihood. The circus is 95% science, 5% showmanship. Most of the time when somebody is practicing a circus act, they are trying to infuse that very scientific concept into their body so that they're able to do it. Being able to swing from one trapeze to another or walk very high in the air on a tight wire. It's all about having your body realize and work with that concept. If anyone can demonstrate motion, it's circus performers, and that's exactly what's going on here at the New York Hall of Science. Children wiggle in their seats with excitement as they learn about Newton's scientific principles. What is it you hope that the kids today got out of what you showed them? Well, the main thing is fun, okay? But I, I feel like children in general learn a lot more if they're having fun with the uh, subject at hand. So if they can see uh, basic scientific principles demonstrated in a fun way, they're going to remember that the next time they encounter it, whether it's on the playground or at the circus or at home. What did you learn about science? About molecules and... <laughs> Adams. Were you surprised at how much science goes into that circus? Yes. Do you like science? Yes. Well, what do you do in science? What do you think scientists do? Do experiments. I think you are right. Do you think you might want to be a scientist? Good. Good for you. But educators worry too often that early enthusiasm for science doesn't translate into long-term interest. Research suggests students here in the United States are not as proficient in science and math as students in some other countries. So why the disconnect? Richard Steinberg, a professor of education and physics at City College, says many children aren't taught science in a way that makes it meaningful. And he sees the impact of that with his own college students. Well, they come in with, uh, with uh, good high school credentials. They come in with good scores on their high school science regents exams. And they know a lot of the words and they know a lot of the formulas, but they're unable to answer questions different from the ones, the very ones that they've seen. So they don't have the deeper understanding. They don't have the deeper understanding. And I think a student is more likely to enjoy something if they're really challenged and then meet the challenge. And I don't think it's a real challenge to memorize a bunch of words you don't understand. Part of the challenge for educators is making sure students see science as something that's both relevant and exciting. And that's important not just for future scientists, but for all young people. Professor Steinberg points out the ability to think scientifically is a skill that extends far beyond the classroom. We want to make right decisions when we, uh, when we think about our health, when we think about how to vote, when we think about uh, uh, how to raise our children and how to interact with our colleagues at work. We want to be able to do it intelligently, thoughtfully. What better place to develop and execute those skills as a child than in, the, than in science? Science can be fun, and children aren't the only ones who need to learn to think a little more like scientists. The key is understanding the why and the how, like why and how my clown friends were able to get this plate spinning on my finger. So it's the Petri dish. Is it, it does not balance on the stick. No, it doesn't. It's spinning, okay? Yes. So we're going to give it a little bit of a spin, a little bit of momentum, so it's going to have a little bit of inertia behind it. And now, whoa! And now, what I And I'm, whippy, boom. skippy, looky there. Here it's we now go. It's now balance stick. And put your finger right in the middle. Um, woo! Nice. Look at that. Ladies and gentlemen. Look, Look at, at that. that. You're almost a, you're almost a circus if star. If that's not I scientific, science I don't know. Experiment. There's only Very one good. way yes. to make this better. Here, here we go. go. And oh, hey, hey, here hey. we go. Hooray! In order to get the plate to balance at the level of equilibrium on the end of the stick, we had to use momentum to get the plate actually spinning. Once it was in motion spinning, we were able to get it to balance on the stick. Now, that way we can simply transfer it to the end of your finger. Now, why it slowed down? Well, it's because of these delightful nails you have. It was <laughs>
For a lot of people, science as a topic can feel intimidating or foreign, but when you look at science as part of everyday life, even something as seemingly unscientific as going to the circus takes on new meaning. I'm Carol Ann Riddell for Science and You. I'm Barry Mitchell in Brooklyn. Understanding science is easy. If you're a scientist, fortunately, for the rest of us, there's... Todd Rosenberg. Todd Rosenberg. Todd Rosenberg. <laughs> Todd Rosenberg, and I do science cartoons under the name Odd Todd. If you dig a hole almost anywhere in the lower 48 states of the USA straight through the Earth, you will come up not in China, but in an ocean. It turns out our 48 states lie directly opposite a cold, empty sea near Antarctica. Yeah. Todd Rosenberg is certainly an odd choice to teach us science. He has no science degree. I was a very poor student. <laughs> I was distracted. I was a cartoonist. I wasn't, you know, yeah, I, did. I was a bad student. My parents are not happy with that. But Todd says not having a formal background in art or science is an advantage. I know that if I get it, other people can get it because I don't get a lot of stuff that easily. I am not a brilliant scientist or whatever. I'm just a cartoon guy who likes to explain things well. But about a decade ago, Todd was trying to explain to himself why he was unemployed. Probably because the dot-com he had been working for went belly up. Business development wasn't his thing anyway. So Todd filled his days teaching himself flash animation. And that's when he found success in failure. Is it safe to say that one viral video on the internet made your career. Without question. You know, I used to wonder about these people who'd be like hanging out like on a Tuesday afternoon looking like they got nothing to do and nowhere to go and being like, what's their deal? Not one of those people people wonder about. In 2001, Laid Off A Day In The Life became one of the internet's first viral video sensations. And then I thought about how I should really like do some volunteer work, you know, and like help out with the community. And the fact that I seriously considered volunteering made me feel better about not volunteering. Among the millions who saw laid off was the inventive TV correspondent, Robert Krolwich. Krolwich uh, reached out to me through the internet and he wanted to know if I was interested in putting cartoons on the news. And bingo, like Lewis and Clark, Bell and Watson, Abbott and Costello, a legendary, a legendary team, team was born. born. He persisted and we started working together and since then we've uh, had a partnership where we've produced um, dozens of cartoons for ABC and uh, NPR's website as well. We did uh, something about can ants count? We count. You what? Like this. One, two, three, four, five, six. Recently we did uh, a cartoon about how much does a hurricane weigh. I don't know and I don't care. He really has a usually a a fairly clear vision of exactly what he wants to be doing and how it could be done and I kind of you know pepper it with with things and I you know make things pop. Robert will leave the voice over here and if I see a place where I might be able to kind of interject something I'll like just cut a pause in the the read itself and then put in a little like oh yeah and then of course they died. <laughs> Why do we expect to be entertained nowadays while we're learning? Um, when I look at my nephews and my niece and how they're growing up and how they spend their days, you know, if they're not outside playing, is in front of screens. And whether it's their uh, eye touches or video games, they are used to that as a part of their daily lives. I mean, some of the cartoons that I that uh, science cartoons that I've done have been shown everywhere from seventh grade classrooms all the way up through MIT. And it, it's, it's interesting because when a new cartoon goes up at NPR, the biggest reaction is from educators because they want it on DVD and you know, th there seems to be not a ton of this sort of fun, sciencey stuff. Now we're a sugar. You're fructose, aren't you? Unless you glucose? No, thank you. What about sucrose? No, no, thank what you. What about fran... Fran Fran French toast. No, thank you. <laughs> and also, I think the, the fact that my drawing style is relatively simplistic, I think the information gets absorbed easier than in three minutes than it might be from 20 minutes of reading. I'm now producing cartoons for uh, Blue Cross to get some messages out. So it seems like the containment of messages in general inside of these three minute short attention, attention span theater ways with characters and everything else is really starting to expand because people uh, don't want to read things and they want to see things like ants walking around. Many 
me a mean gruesome. And to see more of Todd Rosenberg's work, go to oddtoddstudios.com. Send me an email. If you'd like to talk about doing cartoon, you could hire me. Do one so I don't <laughs> end up unemployed again. Something. You do great work. Thank you Thanks so Thanks so much. I appreciate it. I'm Barry Mitchell in Brooklyn. You're watching Science. Science. And you. That's our show for today. Thanks for joining us. I'm Donna Hanover. See you next time on Science and You.